Welcome to the uh, Ian P. Howard Memorial Lecture having this year. And it's a pleasure this, uh, to introduce um, uh, the speaker for this, not the, the lecturer. Uh, it's named after Ian Portius Howard, that's what P stands for. And uh, some of you have never met him because unfortunately he died in, in June 2013. And so many of you have started since that time. And it's uh, so a shame that you haven't because he was. He was quite a character, <laughs> known for his wisdom and insight, and also very practical. He built lots of his equipment, some of which you can still see uh, lying around, and some of which is still actually in use. And some of the equipment that he built was, uh, has now been replaced, but was um, uh, definitely inspired by him. For example, the tumbling room. That, uh, we, we gave uh, Mary a tumble in this the other day, and, uh, and very impressive, because it's a, such a simple concept and he had such a powerful experience. And this, I think, was the fundamental part of what Ian was all about, this uh, very simple uh, ways of, of doing research, but with very powerful and perceptual consequences. So, uh, and I think we're following on in that tradition a little bit, because Mary is well known for some of the uh, very simple sorts of uh, stimuli that she's using, but able to make uh, profound statements about our perceptual mechanisms and so forth from this um, from this simple basis, and I think that's very much in the spirit of uh, of Ian Howard. So I want to welcome uh, Mary Peterson today from the University of Arizona. Um, she did a PhD in Columbia, and she was an assistant professor at the State University of New York for a while before going to uh, Arizona in, in 1998, where she's been. Uh, 1980. 1980. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's been out by a decade. Right? So, uh, okay. Uh, she's chair of the executive committee of the School of Mind, Brain, and Behavior at the University of Arizona, which is sort of something mo most comparable to the Center for Visual Research, I think. There's some, some uh, parallels there. Uh, she's a fellow of the American Association of the Advancement of Science, the Society for Experimental Psychologists, the Association for Psychological Science, the American Psychological Association. She's involved in a lot of this sort of administration of these uh, important uh, organizations. She's also been chair of the governing body of the Psychonomic Society and, uh, and is on the governing body of the BSS. She's also, and this is an important one, the founding member of Females of Vision et al. Phobia, uh, which seeks to uh, enhance the success of women in visual science. So she's an important, very important role there, I think. And as I've mentioned, you're really uh, well known for uh, work using very simple sort of stimuli, especially looking at the perception of objects versus their background. I think we're going to hear uh, a little bit about that now, uh, and our object perception beyond a feed-forward view. Thank you, Lawrence. Thank you. It is a pleasure to be here. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Is it too loud? No. Okay, good. So I want to start by saying what an honor it is to be invited here to give the Ian P. Howard Lecture. I never met Ian. I knew who he was uh, from conferences that I attended. And I know his work is on depth perception, spatial orientation. I've seen videos of him on the web and heard about his parties, <laughs> which uh, I'm sad to have missed. Anyway, uh, it's an honor because I think he, he was a real intellectual powerhouse. My work is on object detection, uh, not depth or orientation perception. And that is specifically detecting where objects lie with respect to a border in the scene. It's critically important for reaching and for navigation. And like depth perception, it is associated, supported by lots of priors. I'm going to show you a few examples of the fact that object detection entails border assignment. Uh, there are borders everywhere, and the visual system has to determine which are bounding contours of objects and which are not, which are stripes in a pattern. And, and zebras are a prime example. Lots and lots of borders there. Only some of them are borders of the zebras. Uh, for zebras, this is a great camouflage for them. When they travel together as a herd, predators cannot distinguish one zebra from another, and so they can't catch one. But low B to the uh, zebra that falls behind uh, and is no longer camouflaged uh, with the rest of the herd, um, then uh, the predator can get that zebra. This is a picture from the web that many of you may have seen, and it's a really nice 
uh, example of the fact that if the border is assigned to one side, that side is the object locally, and the other side is a shapeless background. It is not shaped by the contour. So I'm going to start with the profile of the face. I know some of you may be seeing the profile of the face and others otherwise. But if that border is assigned uh, to the face side, you see a profile of the face facing off to the right. And the white region on the right side appears shapeless near that border. It is simply continuing behind. It looks like a background to the face. But now, if you can, uh, reverse this so that you now assign the border to that white region. And now what you see is a face looking straight ahead at you, partly occluded by this articulated border. Now it's the face that is shapeless near the border. It's the occluder that has a shape given by that uh, curvilinear contour. And that's an excellent example of figure ground perception and the fact that the object is the object that is shaped by the border. <clears throat> Here's an example I like from art as well. Uh, William Wegman uh, took this photograph and titled it Wine Glass. And if you know William Wegman's work, he loves to take photos of his wine runners. Uh, and he is now lined two of them up. Uh, so the shape between their two legs is indeed that of a wine glass. So uh, William Wegman's was playing with figure ground uh, segregation here as well. So the side to which the border is assigned is the side that has shape. So how does object detection occur? How does border assignment, how is it accomplished? The traditional view was via serial uh, feed forward processes. And what I'm showing you here is the traditional uh, diagram of the visual system uh, published by uh, Fellerman and Van Essen in 1991. And what you can see is the dorsal stream on the left, the ventral stream on the right, uh, and the portions of the ventral stream are color-coded in this version of the diagram to correspond to the color-coding in this feed-forward model of vision uh, by Thomas Sara and Thomas Poggio and colleagues. And so what they have done is they've modeled uh, visual perception by feed-forward connections through the various layers of the visual system. Uh, object recognition, their model happens in the anterior inferior temporal lobe, and semantics are represented in the prefrontal cortex, so corresponding to the region here in purple. So this is a feed-forward model on the right. I want you to notice that some of the arrows in the filament and Van Essen diagram are feedback arrows. They're bidirectional arrows. They go backwards. But there are no bidirectional arrows in this model of perception. Also here you can see a little area called PRH, periorontal cortex. Uh, that's not at all a part of the ventral stream, according to the model. Uh, and I'll come back to that later in my talk. So what is the classic feed-forward view? Uh, that generic properties, image-based properties only, determine where an object or a figure lies with respect to a border. Properties like small area, convexity, symmetry, collinearity, etc. Past experience operates only after object detection or figure assignment has occurred. Uh, one has increasingly holistic representations as one goes up, higher in the hierarchy, uh, and responses to features and parts are lost as one goes up higher in the hierarchy. And feedback to lower levels is unimportant. That's the classic view, and I will be challenging that view. I have been challenging that view for many years. So what I'd like to do is give you a brief historical <coughs> review of research done in my lab in the past that shows that past experience affects object detection figure assignment. Then I'll present an alternative to the classic feed-forward view uh, that is a hierarchical Bayesian approach to perception. And I will tell you about four recent experiments that support the alternative view. So first, a quick review through my old research. I got some results in my lab uh, that suggested to me that, well, this basic assumption that object memories are activated only after figure assignment is wrong. I held that assumption, as did everybody else in the field. It took me about six months to understand my uh, anomalous uh, results, but it turns out that they were very serendipitous because it set me in a direction of beginning to look for effects of past experience on figure assignment. So the displays you see here were created in a deliberate attempt to look for effects of past experience on figure assignment. 
We created displays like the one you see in the upper left here, uh, where uh, it's what I call a bipartite display. It's a two-part display with an articulated border down the middle. On one side of that border, there's a portion of a familiar real-world object. Uh, the other side is simply the complement to that. Uh, and we wondered, does your past experience with this familiar real-world object affect figure assignment? We had tried to equate the two regions on either side of the border for all sorts of those generic properties I mentioned before. But just in case we hadn't, we didn't compare your likelihood of seeing the region with the familiar configuration as figure versus the complement. We compared your likelihood of seeing the region with the familiar configuration when it was upright versus when it was inverted. And the idea is you build up your familiarity with raw objects that have a canonical or typical orientation by seeing them in that canonical or typical orientation. Uh, and that is the familiar object. So if these are effects of past experience, we should see the effects on the upright display and not on the inverted display. Of course, you can recognize the inverted display as an upside-down woman. Uh, but uh, there's a lot of evidence that the neural population doesn't reach its threshold uh, in, in uh, fast enough time or in as quickly as it does for an upright display, and it may not be as fast as needed for figure assignment. You can see the uh, data in the bottom part of the slide. Subjects were more likely to report seeing the critical region as figure when the displays were upright rather than inverted. And after having been rotated around in that totally room, uh, I think that many of you might not show this effect. You might have seen many things upside down quite often, uh, especially if you, if you work in, in the lab here. So in later work, we showed via um, ERPs that access to the familiar configuration of the upright displays is signaled in an ERP at uh, P100, P, uh, 105 milliseconds after stimulus onset. So where do we go next? These first displays we created had no other uh, property that would favor object detection, favoring one side or the other. We next asked what happens to past experience if it is in a display where some of the generic properties might operate as well. So we created displays like you see on the right side of the screen now. Uh, the region in white here uh, is a symmetric region. That's one of the generic properties. And the region in black is a portion of a seahorse. And we're showing it inverted in the top display, upright in the bottom display. And these data are the percentage of trials on which subjects saw uh, the region portraying the familiar <coughs> object as figured. So the first thing to notice is that, again, when the displays are inverted, subjects are not perceiving the region depicting a familiar object as figure. They only report seeing that region as figure on 29% of the trials. So OK, symmetry is operating in these displays. Symmetry is one of those generic cues. Subjects are seeing the symmetric regions as figure on 71% of the trials. What happened when we turned the displays to upright? Well, we more than doubled the probability that subjects would see the figure on the familiar configuration side of the border. But you're probably thinking, well, big deal. 59% is not very much greater than you'd expect on the basis of chance alone. It's a big difference between inverted and upright, but what's going on here? Uh, what we figured was that familiar configuration is one of many figural or object priors. It doesn't dominate, and it is competing to be seen as the figure, competing with symmetry, which is also an object prior, one of the classic Gestalt cues. But on the basis of these experiments, which are just a sampling of the ones we did uh, between 1991 and 1994, we concluded the past experience affects uh, figure assignment, and the serial view is incorrect. So I want to move on now to an alternative uh, hierarchical Bayesian framework. And I'll describe it to you uh, with respect to the displays I've been showing you. This is a framework that was proposed by me and Mumford in 1998 and uh, also in 2003. The idea is that visual perception proceeds as a process of hierarchical inference. Uh, for both sides of borders, the visual system is going to have fast access to uh, past experience, to information that might help decide which side of the border uh, the figure lies on. Multiple hypotheses are generated at this stage of processing. And so, for example, for this display, the hypothesis that the black region is a familiar object for the region on the left 
and that the white region is a symmetric object for the region on the right. Those hypotheses seek confirmation uh, via a process of prediction, seek confirmation at lower levels in the brain. And they compete to be perceived across all levels of the brain. The winner is perceived and the loser is suppressed. And again, the notion is that the suppression uh, should be evident across the levels of the hierarchy. So let's take a look at four recent experiments that support uh, various aspects of this view. And I'll start with experiments uh, suggesting that past experience, high-level knowledge is activated before object detection. So the first two experiments I'm going to tell you about, we defined high levels as functionally high levels. So we defined high level access as access to the meaning or the semantics of the objects suggested on one side of the board. In this experiment, the behavioral experiment, was done with Laura Kashimani, Drew Mohika, and Jay Sengman. So we use silhouettes like these in this experiment. These silhouettes are all biased by the generic hues I mentioned before, so that the inside black region would appear to be the object. They're symmetric around the vertical axis, they're enclosed, uh, they're centered on the screen, they're surrounded by a larger area. Uh, subjects fixate these and um, attend to them, uh, so they have subjective factors affecting the figure assignment process as well. But we created these displays, so there are portions of well-known objects suggested on the ground side of the board. Let me show you what they are. Uh, portions of palm trees on the left, portions of Canadian maple leaves, <laughs> and, and portions of table lamps uh, for the stimulus on the right. And I'll turn that off and turn it back on again if some of you missed it coming on in the first place. So we had familiar configuration operating as a prior uh, favoring the outside as the object in the scene. But we designed these displays so that familiar configuration would lose the competition uh, for object status. And now it's not going to lose the competition for all of you because I've taken you through uh, showing you that those objects are there. But of course, we didn't show the subjects in our experiment, the objects that were suggested on the ground side of the water. The stimuli are designed so that they, subjects will not see these regions as the figure. And we have a quite conservative, intensive post-experiment questionnaire to find out whether or not subjects did. And, and the subjects who did see the shapes on the outside, their data are not included in the data I'll show you. And I can happily answer questions about that later. So remember, the participants in our experiments were not aware of those portions of familiar objects suggested on the ground side. So we conducted an experiment where the subject's task was to categorize a word uh, that was shown uh, centered on the screen. And their task was categorize that word as naming a natural object or an artificial object. The word was preceded by a silhouette that was shown briefly, and then there was a short delay. And what we were asking was whether or not the meaning or the semantics of the object suggested on the ground side of the border was activated in the course of a figure assignment. So we set up the relationship between the silhouette and the word such that the object suggested on the ground side of the silhouette either came from the same course category, natural or artificial, uh, as the upcoming word, or came from a different course category. And I think you can see all of the stimuli here, except for maybe the anchor, which I haven't pointed out to you before. So in the left-hand column, we have uh, portions of objects hidden, not consciously perceived on the ground side of the border that are from the same course category, natural or artificial, as the word that subjects have to categorize. And in the right-hand column, objects from the different course category. So we're going to care, compare subjects' reaction times to categorize the words as a function of whether or not they are preceded by a silhouette suggesting an object from the same or a different course category on the ground side. So if semantics are not activated, we should have no difference in reaction times between uh, the same category conditions and the different category conditions. If semantics are activated and they're not suppressed when the uh, shape on the outside loses the competition to be seen as the object, then the same category response time should be faster than different category response times. 
There is another possibility, and that is that the semantics are activated and they're suppressed when the familiar configuration loses the competition to be seen as the figure, in which case subject reaction times would be longer in the same category condition than the different category condition. Okay, have you mentally voted? You know how your data are going to come out? Uh, what we found was that subjects were faster to categorize the words that were in the same, that were preceded by a silhouette of an object that had a portion of a familiar configuration from the same basic level category suggested but not consciously perceived on the ground side of the border. Okay. Faster to categorize them as portion, as uh, natural or artificial objects. Uh, and so when you look at these data, you might say, well, but maybe the silhouettes that are suggested in natural border on the outside have more curvilinear borders. And it's the borders of the silhouettes themselves, qua objects, that are causing this effect. And nothing about the semantics of the shape suggested on the ground side of the object. So we rotated these displays to an inverted orientation, as we had used in our previous experiments. And you can see that we did not get uh, the statistically significant difference between the same and different category uh, with the inverted displays. And in fact, subjects were faster in the same category upright than in the same category inverted. Uh, this is a nice interaction, showing us that it is the semantics of the shapes suggested on the ground side of the border uh, that are motivating this effect. Next thing we did was we looked for neural evidence consistent with this hypothesis. This work was done with Jason Minney and John Allen, and we're measuring ERPs in this experiment. So now that we supplemented the silhouettes you saw before with two other types of silhouettes, <coughs> other novel silhouettes that don't suggest a portion of a familiar object on the ground side, but these other novel silhouettes were matched to the set of objects that suggest something familiar on the ground side in all the low-level features we could think of, including border length and spatial frequency, area, and all the course, uh, all the generic cues that I mentioned before. We also supplemented the set with pictures of familiar real-world objects. These could not be matched, and I'm not going to compare ERPs uh, to the familiar objects and the novel objects. In this experiment, we presented the stimuli one at a time, centered on the screen for 175 milliseconds and followed the stimuli with a pattern mask up for 250 milliseconds. And then we gave subjects time to make their response. Is it a real world object or uh, a novel object? And what I'll show you are their accuracy data here. Uh, what you can see is that there's no difference in accuracy as a function of whether or not there is a familiar configuration suggested on the ground side of the border, and they don't take any longer, their reaction times are not any longer. If anything, they're faster. Uh, and you can see that subjects are highly accurate with the novel silhouettes. Uh, they're less accurate with the familiar <coughs> objects shown in silhouette view. And we're not really sure what the reason for this is. One hypothesis is undergraduates who were our participants don't know what this object is in the upper left anymore. Um, but obviously that's not it. It's actually very hard to recognize an object as a familiar object from just the border information alone. But the critical thing is that they're equally accurate with the two types of novel displays. So we were running a repetition paradigm here. And in a repetition paradigm, you repeat each silhouette, in our case, after uh, four and seven intervening trials. And we were recording ERP, as I said before. A previous work by Bosch, Tendon, and Peller had shown that you get a large uh, repetition effect in the form of a decreased amplitude N3 or 400 component uh, when you repeat a meaningful stimulus, but not when you repeat a meaningless stimulus. I will show you a version of their data with our own data because we replicated their effects. So when we repeated the meaningful object, what you see here in the upper left, is we had a, a nice decrease in the uh, amplitude of the negative component around N300, N400, but we did not have that decrease in amplitude when we repeated the novel objects that had nothing familiar suggested on the ground side of the board. So the question is, uh, what do we find when we 
take our objects where we've suggested a portion of a familiar object on the ground sign, but the subjects are perceiving these as novel objects. They're accurate in reporting them as such. Uh, they are not slower in their reaction times. What we found was uh, the decrease in the amplitude of the N300-400 component, which shows that the brain was processing the meaningfulness of the semantics of the object suggested on the ground side of the border. What's interesting is if you look out a little bit further in processing, you see a different kind of repetition effect, which is evident around P500, P600, P uh, which has been correlated with subjects' conscious awareness of a repeat of a stimulus. And you can see that subjects have that for the familiar real-world objects, but they don't have that for our novel objects with a portion of a familiar object on the ground side. And we take this as evidence that subjects are not consciously recognizing those shapes on the ground side. So we're in more conscious recognition territory out here at 600 milliseconds post-stimulus onset. Still, you might say, well, maybe it's something about the borders and the silhouettes. So we follow them through the second experiment, where the first exposure was to uh, the name of an object. And the name of the object uh, matched the object suggested on the ground side of the border of our novel objects with meaningful grounds. And of course, mismatched it for the other objects, the, the other silhouettes, because there was no familiar object there. And now we compare the N300 and N400 uh, attenuation for the two types of silhouettes. And we saw a greater attenuation for the repeats uh, for the experimental silhouettes with the portions of the familiar objects on the ground side. And this to us really strongly suggested this effect is semantic. The relationship between a word and an object is mediated by the semantic system. So I've talked about two experiments that show uh, that high-level knowledge in the form of semantics is activated before object detection. It's activated for regions of the display that one does not ultimately perceive as the object. So we are defining high-level functionally there. I want to now move on to three experiments where we define high-level structurally. And I'll go back in time a little bit and tell you about a background experiment that sets these experiments up. So back to these bipartite displays, which I'll use in the rest of the experiments I'll tell you about. Uh, here we have a familiar configuration with all the parts arranged in a proper relationship. We wonder, are the effects of past experience we're observing, are they due to the whole configuration, or are they due to the familiar parts? To answer that question, we cut the familiar configuration at its minimum of curvature, define parts between two successive minima of curvature, and spatially rearrange uh, parts. So watch this. <laughs> so we created a novel configuration out of the parts of the familiar object. And now we could ask, with college students, um, is the familiar configuration qua whole configuration seen as figure more often than the novel configuration made up of the familiar parts? And the data are shown down here. The answer was yes. Um, we used the same paradigm we had used before, and we found a nice strong effect of familiar configuration. So this led us to conclude uh, that familiar parts alone are not sufficient. Uh, for familiar configuration effects. That's why we call them familiar configuration effects. The height of our stimuli was approximately six degrees uh, in visual angle. And so we reasoned that high levels in the visual system uh, that can encompass the full configuration were activated in the course of figure assignment. Uh, so it's a high structural level, uh, but it turns out there are higher levels still involved. <clears throat> So I want to take you to some research on the uh, uh, perirhinal cortex, the role of the perirhinal cortex of the medial temporal lobe in perception. <clears throat> what is the perirhinal cortex? Uh, it's a medial region of the brain. Uh, its inputs are from the what has traditionally been considered the highest level of the ventral processing stream, uh, TE. Uh, has inputs to the perirhinal cortex, and then the perirhinal cortex has inputs to the anterior cortex and to the hippocampus. The perirhinal cortex is known uh, to differentiate between familiar and novel objects. There's been a lot of evidence showing that in memory research. 
And, and for a long time, the perimental cortex was considered a portion of memory uh, region. It involved in declarative memory only, with no role in perception. But Morgan Berens, uh, uh, Lucy Agath, I'm sorry, and Graham, uh, took some very complex uh, objects and asked patients with perimental cortex damage to do an odd one out task with these fribbles, they're called. And they told them, look, here are seven items. Uh, six of them pair into pairs, and one of them is an odd one out. Find the odd one out. Uh, and it turns out that when the objects you're showing perimental cortex damage patients are sharing a lot of common parts, uh, they have grave difficulties in doing this task. And so they argued on the basis of data like these, oh, the odd one out is a little more in the bottom row. They haven't found it yet. Um, they argued on the basis of these data that the parallel cortex was involved in uh, visual perception. But many people, including me, said, hmm, this is a working memory task. You have to remember which objects you've paired, where they are. There's a lot of spatial information, a lot of eye movements involved here. This is not the greatest uh, index of perception. What would be, well maybe, uh, my uh, task looking at whether or not familiar configuration influences figure assignment. So this work was done with Morgan Berens, who's at uh, UT, and her students, Joan Nigoa and Lily Hong. And we asked, do patients, or I'm sorry, individuals with damage to the periorontal cortex of the medial temporal lobe show familiar configuration effects on figure assignment compared to those part rearranged displays where we have the same parts presented just arranged in a novel configuration. So we show them such displays. So here's a familiar configuration made of familiar parts in a bipartite display. We're going to ask them to make a judgment. Where does the object lie with respect to the border? Here's that part rearranged version I showed you before. And then we created a control condition where we took the part rearranged stimulus and turned it upside down, and that is shown here. And now we reasoned, using the same reasoning we had used before, that this was now an unfamiliar object because the novel configuration itself was unfamiliar. We've now turned the parts upside down. And my hypothesis, your familiarity with parts accrues along with your familiarity with the object and its canonical orientation. So these are now unfamiliar parts. So we showed these displays to the individuals with perigonal cortex damage, as well as to control subjects. And when you test brain damage patients, you have to show the displays for a longer period of time. Uh, their uh, processing is slowed. Uh, so we showed the displays to the control individuals, age match controls, uh, for a longer duration of time as well. And what you can see here uh, is that um, the control subjects show a nice, strong effect of familiar configuration. They report seeing the object lying on the familiar configuration side of the border uh, substantially and significantly more often than they report seeing it on the side of the border where the part rearranged version lies. This is what we obtain in short exposures with college students. And performance with the new control stimuli is equivalent uh, to performance with the other novel configuration. So again, for the control subjects who are intact neurologically, uh, they are not responding to the parts at all. We also tested patients with hippocampal damage only. Why? Because patients with perioral cortex damage typically and ours did, have damage to the hippocampus as well. Um, it often uh, follows from encephalitis, which starts in the hippocampus, and if it's not caught early enough, affects the perioral cortex. So <clears throat> patients with hippocampal damage only look the same as our age-matched, neurologically intact controls, so I'm not showing you two sets of data. But what about the two individuals we tested who had damage to the perioral cortex as well? Well, they looked different. Uh, so first thing to notice is that there's no longer a difference between uh, the percentage of trials in which they report seeing the object on the familiar configuration side of the border versus the side of the border where we have a novel configuration constructed from the same familiar parts. So that familiar configuration effect is gone. And it's gone in two ways. Uh, they're more likely to see the figure lying on the 
uh, side of the border where that part rearranged novel stimulus lies. But they're also less likely to see the figure lying on the side of the border where the familiar configuration lies. But they look just like the control subjects with our control stimulus where both the parts and the configuration are unfamiliar. So it looks like familiar parts are priors for object detection uh, when the PRC, periodontal cortex, is damaged, but not when the PRC is intact. So why would that be the case? There's two ways you could look at it. One way is a classic feed-forward way, and another way is within the hierarchical Bayesian model. So the classic feed-forward way, these are the models that are proposed and implemented by the, in the memory field. The, their claim is that the intact periodontal cortex is where configurations are formed. Uh, in visual perception. Now, vis visual perception psychologists know this, that's not the case. Mm -hmm. um, but when the, and their claim is that when the perigonal cortex is damaged, oh no, sorry, before I get to the damage, that the configuration response is just fed forward from there into whatever processes follow uh, the assembly of that configuration. <coughs> when you have perigonal cortex damage, configurations are not formed, you only have parts to work with, and the parts are equally familiar in the two types of displays, so you just go ahead and use that, those parts. On an interactive hierarchical Bayesian model, there's a much more complicated argument, uh, but I think it's the right argument. Uh, in the hierarchical Bayesian model, uh, one interpretation is generated for the critical region in those displays where there's a familiar configuration on the side of the board. But two interpretations are generated for the critical region in the part rearranged novel displays. One interpretation is that this is a novel configuration. Another interpretation is that this is a familiar object. There's a collection of parts there that have previously been experienced within familiar objects, and they activate the hypothesis that there's a familiar object there. Again, remember the idea is that these Interpretations seek confirmation at lower levels via predictive feedback. When there's more than one hypothesis, those hypotheses compete uh, to be perceived uh, via a process of inhibitory competition. For those part rearranged displays, the winning interpretation is the novel configuration interpretation when your perigonal cortex is intact. And the Loser, the familiar object, and parts consistent with that interpretation are suppressed across the visual hierarchy. For familiar object displays, you would expect to see an enhanced familiarity response to the parts at the lower levels uh, because of feedback to the periodontal cortex. Um, so, um, if you think of people with an intact periodontal cortex or control subjects of all sorts, then the activation of the lower levels of the brain for those parts is very different when the periodontal cortex is intact. Within a familiar configuration, the familiarity response to the parts is enhanced. Within the novel configuration, the familiarity response is suppressed. So of course we wouldn't see effects of past experience from the parts alone when the periodontal cortex is intact. What about damage to the periodontal cortex? Well, you don't have two interpretations generated for that novel configuration. The low-level part familiarity responses are not modulated by feedback from the periodontal cortex. So you have equal familiarity responses in low levels for those parts in both displays, and you can see part familiarity driving performance. So that was a lot of words, but I felt I had to give it to you before I showed you uh, the data. Um, let me tell you about the uh, fMRI experiment I did with Laura Kashimani, Erica Wager, and Paige Scalp to address this in fMRI. Uh, and Laura and Paige are the fMRI experts. So what we did here was cre we created displays where that critical region in our figure ground displays is perceived as the figure. We made that region smaller in area than the adjacent region within the frame. We made that region really high in contrast against the black uh, screen that they were looking at. Uh, and we presented uh, critical regions of the three types I've been talking about now. Uh, familiar configuration here, 
uh, novel configuration made up out of novel foreign parts. Here's our control condition in the middle. And here's our part rearranged novel configuration made up out of familiar parts. And I'm color coding them in red, green, and blue. I'm going to color code the data the same way from now on. We presented these stimuli one at a time. And as subjects, simply make a judgment, look at the stimulus for two seconds, tell us whether that white uh, object out in the periphery uh, depicts a portion of a familiar, well-known object or a novel object. Uh, subjects had two seconds in addition to the presentation to respond. These are some details. The only details I want to be sure to tell you about is that the stimuli were not repeated. They were shown once only in each possible configuration. Uh, and we are going to compare responses uh, when the parts are the same in the three configurations. So if a subject made an error on any one of the configurations, we didn't examine their fMRI uh, performance for the other ones, the matched ones. So the analysis we did, uh, we had a regressor of interest where we predicted activation would be higher in the periorental cortex for the familiar configuration uh, than for the control novel configuration. And this has been seen before by others. But we predicted it would be lower still for the part rearranged novel configuration because in this configuration, as I said before, there are two hypotheses being generated and competing with each other. Is it a novel configuration? Is it a familiar configuration? So we did a cluster-based analysis where we saw clusters of voxels that showed this predicted linear trend in activation uh, with a z greater than 1.96. And we wanted a cluster that was greater than would be expected uh, by random variation alone. In this experiment I'm telling you about, we found a cluster of 22 voxels uh, that met this criterion. And this is a replication of an experiment we had done before, where we found somewhat larger uh, clusters of voxels. What I'm showing you in the bottom of the screen here is not activation, but just where those clusters lay. And they were in the periorental cortex, which can be seen in three different views here. Uh, so that's a z-score, indicating the z-score was 196 or greater. So these are the data averaged over all of the participants, which is not the analysis we did. So you can look at the error bars here. It's not going to tell you much. Remember, we did a cluster analysis. But I wanted to show you the activation we obtained. And what you can see is that, indeed, the response to the familiar configuration, higher activation to that uh, than to the control novel displays. And then reduced activation uh, for the part rearranged novel displays. And we take this as evidence of the inhibitory competition between the two potential interpretations that might be seen. Yeah, so that is a prediction of the hierarchical Bayesian model that is confirmed in the periorental cortex. The periorental cortex is responding differently to the two types of novel silhouettes uh, as, a for, as a function of whether or not they are constructed of familiar parts. The part response is not lost at this high level in the brain. I now want to show you what's happening in the lower levels, and I'm going to show you V2, V1, and uh, V4. Um, you will not be seeing the responses to the parts of the control objects in this analysis uh, for two reasons. One, the parts are not the same. Uh, remember, they were unfamiliar parts. But also, two, we used responses to that stimulus to help us localize an ROI in these early retinotopic areas to see where we're going to look for a difference between our two critical stimuli. And what we find is that even though the parts are the same in the familiar configuration and the part rearranged configuration, in the lower levels of the brain, we see that relative activation mirrors the relative activation you see in the periorum cortex. Higher activation for the familiar parts when they're in a familiar configuration uh, than when they're in a part rearranged novel configuration. Um, and we take this as evidence uh, for feedback to the extent that fMRI evidence can be taken as evidence for feedback. We take it as preliminary evidence for feedback from the periorental cortex 
to the lower level brain regions. The familiarity response to the parts within the novel configuration are suppressed at the lower levels, and the familiarity response to the parts in the familiar configurations may be enhanced. Of course, we don't have a control condition, so we can't tell uh, what's changed with respect to control. So this is in healthy participants? This is in healthy participants, yeah. So would you expect to see in the uh, PRC patients? In PRC patients, no activation in the PRC region, and just equal activation to the... In these areas? Excuse me? In these areas, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Sure. So at the Roy, you can do a functional connectivity <coughs> analysis. Uh, Laura did a PPI analysis. What she did was she took the activation of the periodontal cortex as a seed to see whether or not that seed could predict activation in the lower level regions. And she found evidence of significant uh, connectivity uh, between the periodontal cortex and uh, left hemisphere E2. So this is you know, preliminary evidence for feedback, fMRI, even when you do a connectivity analysis, can't be extremely strong evidence for feedback. And we find evidence for feedback from the periodontal cortex only in left hemisphere uh, V2. But our parts were sized approximately for receptive fields in V2, uh, so we might predict that we would see the effect strongest in V2. So I've now told you about experiments that show that structurally high levels are activated in the course of bigger assignment as well, uh, both in neuropsychology experiment and in fMRI experiment. And we take these data as evidence for the interactive hierarchical Bayesian model, uh, that when you have an intact PRC, an intact brain, high levels are activated before object detection, both functionally given the first two experiments I told you about, and structurally high levels given the periodontal cortex data. Interpretations are generated at high levels, and these interpretations seek confirmation in lower levels and compete with each other if there's more than one interpretation. The figures of the loser are relatively suppressed. Uh, we submit across the visual hierarchy, and the features of the winning interpretation are enhanced. Um, okay, so that's not my claim. And I want to close uh, just by saying, well, some of you might be wondering, what about predictive coding models of vision? And I'll just say a few words about that, and I'll be happy to get into more. Wouldn't you expect a lower response to the parts of the familiar configuration due to low error, uh, because they're expected to be there? Uh, there are a number of models of predictive coding, and I figured the one by Lee and Mumford, where they make the argument I made before. Multiple hypotheses are generated, and those multiple hypotheses seek confirmation at lower levels. And if you and they compete with each other along the way. So my answer with respect to the reduced uh, responses to the parts of the familiar configuration is compared to what? Remember, in the part rearranged novel displays, there was inhibitory competition going on between two potential interpretations. And then uh, suppression is shown across the extent of the visual hierarchy. But there is no competition in the familiar configurations. And on a resonance view, the activity at the lower levels should be uh, resonating with the activity at the higher levels, should be enhanced when you uh, match that hypothesis. And so there is also, I'll point out, something that Lee and Mumford have also pointed out, that there is a debate as to whether or not the reduced responses many people observe are actually simply reflecting sharpening of the responses in the visual cortex as opposed to error. Uh, and I'll close by this, by thank with this by thanking the National Science Foundation and the Office of Naval Research for their support. Thanks again to you for inviting me to give the EMP Howard Warren Lecture and for showing me your exciting work yesterday and today for listening now. Thank you. Yeah, wonderful talk. Um, as I'm sure you know, Barr has suggested that it's low spatial frequency information that hops up to high levels and then generates perhaps hypotheses. Have you done anything with spatial frequency low versus high? No, I haven't. Oops. 
That's a, a great question. And I've been talking with um, Bronca Spihar at the University of New South Wales about a way we could do that. Excuse me, can I get a little water? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I should have yeah. 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 oh, okay. okay. um, yeah, I would love to do that. Of course, Moshe Boris' model, the last time we looked at it, uh, was different. He has uh, jumping up to the frontal cortex, and it's the frontal cortex uh, where the hypotheses are generated, and then feeding back to the lower level areas from the frontal cortex. I'm not sure that's necessary. There's lots of evidence now suggesting that semantics, for instance, the data I have, are represented right in the visual pathway. Um, and the last time I really looked at Moshe's data, uh, it was activation of possibilities in, say, left frontal cortex affecting activation in, say, right ventral cortex. And I, I don't know, it's, it seemed seemed too complicated. However, no, I was just thinking in the sense <laughs> that you might want to generate hypotheses as rapidly as possible from partial data in order to get the comparison and competition process going as rapidly as possible. Yeah, uh, right. And mm -hmm. it could be the case that using magnet cells would be the way to do that, using a little speci spatial frequency version. Yeah. Of course, there is evidence that the periodic cortex is activated within 100 milliseconds of stimulus onset. And so it's pretty fast activation that way too, but it would be an interesting uh, study to do. James. I just talk about how it would go into the real world. Throwing my book. Sorry, you see that. Uh, well, I, I said it first, so I said it So uh, a lot of your stuff is, on the, is, is very flat, right? The, 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 the stimuli are in the same place and so forth, whereas in, in the real world, things are all different. Right? So, uh -huh. so do, do you think there's, can we translate your data into the into the real world. Into the real world. Well, at least as far as real world is defined by stereoscopic displays, uh, you can. So I had a very good uh, graduate student, Brad Gibson, who did that work with me at the, the old work that I was showing you, uh, said to me shortly after he joined my lab, you can't really think these effects can generalize to the real world, can you? <laughs> uh, and so we did a number of experiments. What we, we did was we took uh, the black and white displays and we used uh, stereo disparity to specify that either the familiar configuration region or the complementary region were in front. Um, and it's hard to do this with my hands alone, but I'll try. Um, so uh, as you know, it's just a luminous contour that separates the two. And what subjects saw when, here's the familiar configuration slide, when the familiar configuration was in front, they saw a nice depth step, which is what you'd expect from the stereo display. Uh, when the stereo suggested that the uh, complementary novel region was in front, what subjects saw was that the other region sort of slanted forward in depth and grabbed that central contour uh, so that it looked like including void. Uh, that was really surprising to us. Uh, and it showed us that familiar configuration was operating along the border. Uh, turns out, we learned afterwards that just having a high contrast display is an ambiguous display. Uh, an ambiguous stereo display suggesting this slide is in front could also be suggesting that there's a slanted depth plane in the back. But no, subjects never saw the slanted depth plane when the familiar configuration was specified in front. Do I try to use the board or is this coming across with my hands? Oh, you want the board, so if if the depth specified, I'm oh, sorry, I'm sorry, if the depth specified that uh, the familiar configuration was in the front, uh, subject saw a nice sharp depth edge, and we had them give us magnitude estimations as to how much depth they saw. So they perceived what the stereo specified uh, for the familiar in the front. Uh, if the stereo display suggested that that complementary novel region was in front, they didn't perceive a nice strong depth step. Instead, what they perceived was this region coming up and owning that board at the central region so that it was a slanted plane. Uh, we didn't realize it at the time that actually it is an ambiguous display. There are two interpretations possible uh, for this black and white display. So when I was on sabbatical um, at Berkeley in 2002 uh, with Johannes Burge and Steve Palmer, 
we used displays that had uh, a color contrast border, but also both regions were sprinkled around, uh, very closely with random dots. And now you take away the ambiguity in the display. And so now the question is, what happens? Uh, well, you don't see that slanted uh, flame coming up and seizing the border. But what you see is interesting. Subjects perceive a smaller depth step between the two uh, portions of the display. So the exception is that the region that portrays the familiar configuration is coming up closer in three-dimensional space uh, to the region that portrays the complementary uh, portion of the novel object. So here there is a contrast change across the border, and there are random dots. And when you look at this, the contrast border seems assigned to the familiar side. You recognize, let's say, the face profile there, uh, but you also perceive a smaller depth step. So in terms of stereo, uh, these properties are still operating. Now, if we're in the real world, um, there are lots of redundant cues as to what you see as a figure in the real world. And getting back to talking about object perception in terms of depth perception, so there are something like 15 or so cues for depth perception. Why? Well, because it's very important for us to know what the distance is between objects, and if one of them is not operating, another one uh, will be, and they uh, cooperate and sometimes conflict. And I think familiar configuration in the real world is serving as one more property that is helping us uh, to perceive a shape in the real world. There are many cues, convexity, symmetry, small area, surroundedness, uh, and uh, past experience. So usually it's operating in the real world. Um, and you know, there are portions of familiar objects suggested here and there, and the visual system rejects them as shapes that you will see, um, then presumably uh, one would see the semantics activated as well. James. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, great talk. So uh, I was trying to reconcile your result, this resonance result, where even on these conditions, of less familiar conditions where you find there's um, competition, you, you get lower activation in the early visual cortex. So, um, with, for example, results from Marie and Kirsten, if you know this work with. Oh, yeah. Right. So, um, in the stimulus, um, there are fragments seen moving <coughs> before apertures, and it can either be perceived as a coherent object moving. Thank you. <coughs> exactly. Um, you know, I, I don't know exactly where the occluders are, though. Yeah, oh. they're just circles around, I think. Aren't they stripes? It's usually a stripe. So, I, I if, think you, it's if you see this circle, in the <laughs> what they did was they had four circles, but it doesn't too much matter. <laughs> so you can either see this as a coherent diamond, like Mary's just drawn, or you will see them as four incoherent objects moving independently. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, so, so the interesting thing is what yeah. they found, they were looking regions of interest for LOC and early visual cortex. Yeah. So what they found is that when observers were in the state of seeing the entire holistic object, um, then they found relatively high activation in LOC, right, and depressed elevation, uh, activation in early visual cortex. When observers saw four independent objects, um, the activations were reversed, so they saw uh, lower activation in LSC and higher activation in other visual cortex. And they were cautious in their explanation, but they suggested it's it's consistent with a predictive coding kind of explanation. So anyway, long-winded story, the question is, um, you know, it seems like the opposite, right? So how, how do you compare those two? Um, it does seem like the opposite, and indeed, as James just described, so LOC is a higher uh, visual region, has larger receptive fields, and when you are perceiving it as a closed diamond, they found high activation LOC, low MV2, and the opposite pattern when you're perceiving it as disconnected uh, fragments of lines. And they did interpret this as um, this is low error when you're perceiving the 
of diamond as a closed diamond, you have a low error and fed up to higher regions because those parts are uh, consistent with a higher level interpretation. Um, I, I think that was early in the days of thinking about predictive coding. Uh, and this condition in particular is a condition to which uh, Lee and Mumford speak quite convincingly, in my opinion. And they say, look, there is sharpening of the representation. When you see these four uh, fragments of lines separated, there are many different hypotheses you could fit to those. Uh, there's a lot of activation going on. Uh, and lots of hypotheses being generated and fed to lower level regions. Uh, and you could imagine seeing high activation there because there are so many hypotheses checking uh, what's going on there. Uh, when you have the a diamond shaped, it could be that what you have now is a sharpened response. There is one hypothesis that fits what's going on down there very well. And you can't discriminate between a sharpened response in the visual system and the low error. But when, if you apply that logic to your work, um, in the case when you have um, scrambled parts, you might also argue that there's multiple hypotheses. So, I mean, my guess was going to be that even in your scramble condition, you still see a single object. And if you, if you come up with a way of doing your experiment where actually now you see four different objects that are not actually connected anymore then you might get something closer to their result. If it's a question of seeing one object versus four independent objects? Well, well that's, a mm. very, that's a very nice suggestion because, in fact, we are losing a control condition, uh, and I wish I had one. And as I was saying before, our inverted parts are not the right control. So if you take our parts and, and have them disconnected from each other, uh, that would be very nice. And now the question is, a critically important experiment, thanks. The question is, uh, where does activation fall? So what we now have is a difference in the um, part rearranged. We have lower activation than we have in the familiar configuration. Uh, and it, and uh, the prediction would be the separate parts, there would be lots of hypotheses being generated uh, on the argument I'm proposing, uh, this new James Elder condition <laughs> uh, would be higher activation uh, because there are many hypotheses being applied. On the, um, and that's higher activation, but this is not error that's here. It's not low error. I still submit that it's resonance uh, as opposed to low error. And I think that experiments have to be done uh, to really sort out these two hypotheses. So a lot of the work that I've seen uh, that is in favor of low error being sent forward is not looking at stimuli that come into the eye and activate past experience in the brain, brain not looking at hypotheses that are generated by the input. They're looking at expectation. So if you press the right hand key, you get fractal pattern A. If you press the left hand key, you get fractal pattern B. You learn this over hundreds and hundreds of trials. And then uh, someone like Nick Turk Brown, this is his study I'm talking about, uh, will have fractal pattern A not appear uh, when the, you press the key. Uh, and uh, we'll have sometimes fractal pattern B occur. Uh, and then you have uh, what they call an error response. That it, but expectation uh, generated from all of this experience of pressing a button and expecting a particular fractal pattern uh, I submit is not the best model for understanding a hierarchical Bayesian uh, framework for object recognition. I think we really need to be looking at what's happening when there are uh, memories, when there's past experience activated in the brain, and do we do see something different when it is purely trained expectation in the laboratory uh, as opposed to past experience operating. So more work has to be done here. Um, I, did, I have been in contact with Scott uh, Murray, and um, he says, well, we don't hold to that interpretation. <laughs> so I didn't want to start with that, uh, because there are arguments against it as well. It has been um, addressed by a number of individuals. It was really nice early work. Mm -hmm. OK. Well, uh, Scott. Yeah. 
first of all, I want to apologize for my phone going off or the phone I had. <laughs> Turned it off before uh, we began talking. So oh, thank you for the talk. Um, well, I was thinking from, uh, you know, there's this old saying, it's better to have loved the lost than never to have loved at all. For infants who have had no experience, would they perform similar to PRC patients or those with intact PRCs or something different? And a second part to that is young infants, typically their perceptual behavior is guided by the features of objects more so than the configuration. Yeah. So, um, two answers to that question. I'll start with the second one I thought of first. Right, and it takes a while for the paranormal cortex perhaps to develop. So, if you can test infants before the paranormal cortex has developed, maybe they would look like um, paranormal cortex damaged patients. And when I was here on my last sabbatical, uh, Daphne Maury and I were beginning to look at young children in the body car type <coughs> displays. And sadly, we never got the experiment. Uh, off the ground enough. Uh, with a colleague at the University of Arizona, I found that children as young as, I think it's four years old, uh, show us the same effects of familiar configuration as adults do. Uh, we haven't looked at younger uh, subjects than that. But there was one question we were asking was whether the paranormal cortex has developed sufficiently for us to show, for them to show us effects of familiar configuration as opposed to familiar parts. It, it has. Um, turns out the Down syndrome kids, however, are not showing a very large familiar configuration effect. Uh, they're showing a very small, it's a statistically significant, P less than 0.05, but compared to the um, uh, normally developing kids, they're not showing the effect. Um, infants, I wouldn't expect infants to show us a familiar configuration effect unless they've had experience with these objects. So, when we tested the young children, we also did a core alternative force choice with them uh, with colored pictures, and we'd say, um, which one is the woman, or which one is the seahorse, or which one is the dog, these are all similar we have. And if the children didn't know what said object was, we excluded that from our set of stimuli. Turns out that four year olds know what these common objects are. I think for one child, we excluded one, one stimulus. Um, but we would have to be testing with something that we had either taught uh, the very young infants, uh, or you know, I think that we had taught the young infants. And I've been doing some work with my colleague Rebecca Gomez uh, with four and a half month old infants, uh, trying to teach them a novel object with a very simple border and show them that this sign, let's say, is the figure. And that is, they see it as a three-dimensional object, we hold it up to them, they have experience with it, and then we put them uh, in a test case. Uh, and either, this is also a three-dimensional object, so we either move uh, the object we've learned before, all of these complement together, or uh, we move the object we saw before apart. And we have some evidence uh, the infants have set up, uh, uh, have had enough past experience to expect to see that object moving separately uh, from the complementary region. We have to do some additional work to uh, make certain that it's past experience operating. Uh, so I think it really is past experience. So I think you have to have had sufficient past experience to see the effect. Is that a question back there? You can't move with an object. Okay. I thought we were going to close. You want to? <laughs> so, I saw had his hand up too. Um, your talk is great. I had lots of questions, but my very simple fast one, so we can go train, is how do you know it's familiar? How do you control for that in these studies? And I know I can hear somebody for every three years. That's a really good question. So yeah. You've 30 something people. Can you no. help anyone in your little questionnaire you after? No, no. This, these help? days, the answer is on Turk. Uh, we, do you know what Amtrak is? Yeah. Okay. Mechanical Turk is something through Amazon. We used to do, we would, we would get pilot subjects into the lab, we would show them both halves of the displays we were using, and we would ask them to name all the familiar objects each one resembled. Uh, and so we used to get subjects into the lab to do this, now you can do it on Amazon Mechanical Turk, you can pay people uh, small amounts of money for doing this, 
And when we started the experiments, we were naive enough to think we could have a fully familiar object that everyone would recognize on one side of the border and a fully unfamiliar, unrecognizable object on the other side of the border. We were so naive. I mean, there, there is another old saying, there's nothing new under the sun, uh, and that's true for objects as well. So for what we call a familiar configuration, there's at least 75% agreement amongst pilot subjects that that portion depicts the familiar object, and I'm calling it a dog or a standing woman. Uh, for the complementary side, we have no more than 32% agreement on what the object might be that's represented there. And people say very fanciful things. They oftentimes say faces, and we know that lots of doodles will resemble faces. Um, but yeah, we tried to make certain that there was a real difference in familiarity. And for the complementary side, people will oftentimes say something like, well, it looks like my grandmother's table with a vase on top of it. It's a very complex um, uh, interpretation or the sign of an oak bookcase. And there isn't uh, very much agreement. But the person who says it uh, feels fairly confident that's what it looks like. But we just decided that if we had a high agreement uh, between control subjects, that would tell us that there was probably a fast, good match you reach threshold for recognition quickly. If you have low agreement, you might reach threshold, but late in time, uh, and so it's not a familiar configuration. Uh, yeah, thanks for asking. Some of you are probably sitting here thinking, I see something. Patrick. Oh. Patrick, what please? <laughs> uh, well, I have two questions there. <laughs> First one is just information. I got lost in your middle slides, which was very important, I think, which was the uh, present object on the critical side of normal versus uh, uh, rearranged parts versus upside down. Uh -huh. and For the brain damage patients and their controls? Controls. Well, I, really, I think it was there too. Uh, the lowest that went was 70%. Yeah, so yeah um, it, they did report receiving the familiar configuration as figure uh, more often in the long displays. Um, and, and I see this a lot. We've tested um, older individuals both in other experiments and in this experiment as controls. I'm not allowed to talk anymore. Um, oh, okay. As controls for our brain damage patients. And when you show these displays for a long period of time, and you know, we just say to the subjects, look, give us your first impression. But what we see is the proportion of choices of the familiar configuration go up to about 95%. There are only about 76% in the brief mass exposures. In the novel case. Yeah, they go up as well. Uh, but they, they go up. I mean, that's the thing. Uh, so um, I would say uh, that it's not at 50% uh, because you don't have full suppression of the familiarity, but of the parts. But then if you look here, uh, their choices of the control novel configuration are up at 60% as well. Uh, yeah, I, all, what I can say is that we, there's no way to equate uh, protrusion on both sides of the border or convexity on both sides of the border for sets as large as ours are. So that's one reason we've always compared across upright attack versus inverted attack versus et cetera. Um, so then we know the protrusion is equal. Um, right, but then you would say, why is protrusion operating in the long exposures and not in the 100 millisecond exposures? Because for the first experiment we did with college students comparing part rearranged to intact upright, uh, subjects were at 50% on the part rearranged scale. So, okay, second question. Oh. Uh, maybe an alternative to what you're saying. You're saying that. Uh, Perception and visual system entertains two possibilities at a time. Um, many, I hope. And there's an ambiguous yeah. stimulus. Yeah. And then the winner takes the winner's, you know, yeah. empty, whatever that may be, and the loser gets kicked out. Uh, you could also have a uh, sequential, so take one, work it through, and take net number two, and work it through, and that would be the same. There's lots um, predictions as you get. That's always the case, right? So computationally, you could say, as long as one flips back and forth between the two, you might get the same result. But what I would say to that 
And we can go back to some of the earlier studies we did um, where uh, we were showing that past experience operates in the context of a, a competing figural cube symmetry. Um, Yeah, and there was a hypothesis that um, Epstein, Bill Epstein, had proposed that there's a rapid preperceptual reversal before the visual system determines which side is the figure. And this was designed to allow you to keep access to object memories after the figure assignment had been done. So there's this rapid preperceptual reversal. And then it would say to that, okay, if you do this rapid, I've got the right side of the display. If you do this rapid preperceptual reversal uh, when there's a symmetric uh, region on one side of the display and a familiar region on the other side of the display, what causes you to choose one side or the other as figure? You, you have to have a bias toward one or the other in order to choose one side as figure. And I also wonder why anyone would propose something like this unless they are simply trying to hang on to uh, the old hypothesis that figure assignment must be done before object memories are accessed. That's a really interesting point. If it is parallel, as you would suggest, then the visual system must be able to represent two entirely different spatial configurations at the same time, right. which is yeah. a bit of a challenge. Right. Well, but I think, I mean, what does it mean to represent, and we have to grapple with that in our terminology too. So if you have fast speed forward activation, that suggests a number of possibilities. So you can have those possibilities activated in the brain simultaneously. It's not as if the brain is actually representing as a solid object something that is uh, two objects occupying the same space at the same time. Uh, so you would have to have, have to be holding those hypotheses. Yeah. We can continue to talk about this. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> Ah, that's good. I want to thank you so much. Thank you very much for your for your talk. Thank you. Very much. Thank you for your questions. You're all welcome. And before we go, I have a little presentation for you. There's a, 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 a little York memorabilia. Oh, yeah. And, uh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.